So welcome to 1 Corinthians. <laughs> what an adventure this is going to be. We've been um, working our way through numbers and uh, on, on a personal level, I have loved doing numbers. Um, I loved listening to the sermons and the messages that people have brought to us and loved reading through that that great book from the Old Testament. But it is wonderful this morning to be moving on to the New Testament, to Corinthians and to 1 Corinthians. It's going to be quite a long series. You might think um, reading 1 Corinthians through, there's only 16 chapters or so, that it's not going to take that long. But these chapters are so full of content, full of blessing and full of controversy and full of theology that um, we couldn't do sometimes a whole chapter in a morning. So it's going to go on for a little while, but I'm sure that God is going to speak to us, bless us, challenge us, encourage us, rebuke us, call us again to his service as we go through uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, which of course, as Andrew told you last week, is not actually his first letter at all, but it's the first letter that we have a copy of. Andrew started us off with uh, an overview, with an introduction last week, but we weren't certain we were going to start this week. However, we've made the decision to jump in and get on with it, and I feel very privileged to be able to bring these first few verses. I'm just going to be looking at the first nine verses um, this, this week. I, I'll read it to you later, but not quite yet. I think one of the first things that I realized as I read these nine verses and then on into the 10th verse that um, there is one thing which seems to be just striding through these 10 verses repeatedly stated and that is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 10 times in 10 verses Jesus is mentioned by name. Now, let me tell you, this is going to be a very difficult letter for Paul to write. It's a letter to a church with all sorts of issues and a letter that will deal with some very difficult and challenging situations. Paul could have tried to deal with these things with an appeal to logic and reason or perhaps with an appeal to his own reputation as a church planter, an apologist for the Christian faith and as a great theologian. He could perhaps have tried a legal route or maybe as I might have been challenged to do, he could even have um, hired half a dozen Welsh rugby players to go around and put the frighteners on the troublemakers, uh, run them out of town if you like. But he doesn't do any of those things. What does Paul do in the face of writing to these people in Corinth who are causing so many problems? What he does, he appeals and repeatedly points to Jesus. He shines the light of Christ's love and Christ's cross on the church in Corinth. That's his primary concern. I want the people to look to Jesus. I don't want the people to look to me. I want the people to look to Jesus. And if you look at the very first verse of the book of 1 Corinthians, something is stated. It's stated quietly. It makes a huge point, but in just a very few words. Paul writes not as we might expect to the church in Corinth. You might think to yourself, well, he's going to address this to the church in Corinth, but he doesn't. If you look again, you see that what Paul points to, what he addresses this letter to, is the church of God that is in Corinth. This is not the church of Corinth. That he's writing to. It is first and foremost the church of God. Now and that seems to me to be a very tactful way of reminding the people in Corinth who's in charge here. It's not their church. It's not their possession. They can't just do what they like. It's God's church. 
they don't make the rules and they don't set the standard. And I'd like to say for us too, that Hill City is not our church. It's not Die Hankey's church, though many people once referred to it in that way. It's not even Pontoenith Independent Evangelical Church. It's the church of God. It's God's church placed in Pontoenith. And as the church of God in Corinth, and for us as the church of God that will one day meet again at Emmaus Chapel, we have certain characteristics that mark us out and identify us as belonging to God. And I want to speak into that subject a little this morning, but first let me just introduce you a little to the people that Paul will be writing to. It's a very difficult situation, as I've already said. The church is riven, divided by all sorts of different factions and opinions. There's division here. Some people are saying, well, of course, I'm a follower of one individual. Therefore, the implication is I'm a little better than you. And somebody else says, well, no, I don't follow him. I follow this one. He's far finer. And a third faction, oh no, we prefer. And then one faction, I'm not quite sure if they're sincere or there's a little bit of superiority here saying, oh no, we're none of those, we're of Christ. There's spiritual elitism too. We're going to learn more about the gifts of the Spirit as we go through this great book but in Corinth some people were saying oh I've got this gift or I've got that gift and those are better gifts and consequently there's pride and jealousy on either hand there are feelings of failure and inadequacy on another there are also feelings of superiority which is leading to cliques within the church as well as that, there's disorder at the Lord's Supper. And Paul is horrified to find that Christians are taking other Christians to court. He, he finds that a terrible thing. Worse still, there is major sexual depravity going on. Someone who is accepted and tolerated by the church is in a relationship with his mother-in-law terrible situation again to Paul and there are disputes between Christians who wish to impose their understanding of correct Christian ethics on other people so with all of that in mind if you were going to start this letter and write it if you were doing what we find Paul is doing how would you begin what would be your first steps to writing to the people of Corinth. I think what I would do is go along to WH Smith's and maybe get myself a nice big ream of paper. I'm going to need all of that. This is going to be a long letter and by the time I finish I will probably have used every single sheet of it. I'm going to go to another place in that shop and I'm going to get myself a nice pack of biros not just the multi-pack of black ones that you get. I'm going to get a pack of black with a couple of red ones as well, because I'm certainly going to need a red pen to underline some of the things I'm going to say. I'm also going to get myself a nice yellow highlighter. You know the ones you mean, just to highlight the things that I think these people listening to me or reading my words should take on board. And then I'll start the letter dear scumbags no no i'm not going to put that that wouldn't that would in, wouldn't induce people to listen to me at all how about to the so called church in corinth uh, maybe not that either so how am i going to start my i i know what i'll do it is with considerable regret that i find myself compelled to write to you and then i'll tell them everything that's wrong with them. That might be better. 
But hang on, let's just see how Paul addresses these people. With all the problems they've got and all the problems that they're causing, how will Paul begin his letter to the people in Corinth? Let me read it to you now. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. Paul, by the will of God, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs> now, Paul, if you've read any of the other uh, letters written by him, Paul is not given to sugar-coating his words. He's not one who is prone to vain flattery. So you might be forgiven for asking, Paul, I think you've put this letter in the wrong envelope, my friend. How can you possibly address this bunch of reprobates as sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. How can you possibly, Paul, give thanks to your God always for them because of the grace of God that was given them in Christ Jesus? It all seems very strange, yet here, right here is one of the great and precious doctrines of the Christian church. But give me a minute, if you would, please. There's another small, <laughs> small perhaps, thing that I need to deal with first. It concerns one word that keeps coming into play throughout the nine verses that are my uh, area today. Four times this word is used explicitly, one not quite so obviously to the English speaking reader, and it bears witness to who exactly we are as Christians this morning. Let's have a quick look at this again. Verse 1, Paul is called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Verse 2, the Christians in Corinth are called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You see that word call coming up time and time again. And then in verse 2, as we've already mentioned, these people are called the Church of God in Corinth. And as most of you will know, the Greek word for church is ecclesia. Back in the 70s, the church was very excited and upset by um, a movement called the ecclesiastical movement that sought to bring together churches from different um, backgrounds and cultures. And, and the word ecclesia means called out. We as Christians today are called out, 
called out of the world, called out of sin, and called into a new way of life and a new relationship with God in Christ Jesus. So verse 2 says, to the church, the called out of God that is in Corinth. So here's my question. What is it that ties together all these disparate people and factions that ties together St. Paul, the Christians in Corinth, the Christians in every place, and the Bible makes it clear that I can add in every age to that, who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it brings together too all those who, by God's grace, are in the fellowship of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And can I add to that too, that calls together every single Christian on this Zoom platform together this morning? And the answer to the question is, the thing that ties us all together, the thing that unites us, and there are lots of things, but in relation to my particular reading, the thing that ties us all together is that every single one has been called by God. Now we could talk about all sorts of other things that unite Christians, of course, but here in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 1 to 9, God's love and grace are highlighted in this one wonderful fact. Romans 5 verse 8 tells us that God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But here too, Scripture makes it abundantly clear that this is personal. He died for us, which includes me, but by his spirit, he called me personally, and he called you personally, just as he called Paul and every other saint, which means every other Christian who ever lived. Did you know? Perhaps you did, I don't know. Did you know that Die Hanky went to see the Queen a while ago? Incredible. He went to see the Queen. It must have been quite a shock for her. So um, I, I wondered how all of that began. And, and at this point, I really wish I could do a Welsh accent or that Di was a Cockney, because I can do a Cockney accent. Every time I try to do a Welsh accent, it sounds like I come from Pakistan. But anyway, you can imagine him phoning up <laughs> the Queen one day. Oh, my days, Liz. <laughs> Buzzing to get you on the phone. Can I come round for a chat? Actually, of course, knowing Di, you and I are fully aware that he would never have done that. He would have sent her a tweet, wouldn't he? But anyway, <laughs> no, it didn't start like that. It didn't start by Di getting in touch with the Queen, it started with the Queen getting one of her people to get in touch with Di and issue the gracious invitation to join her for an Indian takeaway in the back garden one day. And our relationship with God is firmly based on the fact that Christ's death on the cross made it possible for us to approach him as we believe and repent. And secondly, that he graciously called us individually and personally into a relationship with him. The other thing, of course, is that God's calling is far higher than um, we could ever wish it to understand it to be. What a privilege. What a blessing. <laughs> but beyond our expectations, it might be great to go and see the Queen, but to be called to call God, the creator of the world, our Father, our Lord, our Master, and our friend, beyond our understanding completely. So we Christians, we should be full of gratitude and praise this morning. Our salvation is all of him. By grace, we've been saved through faith. And it's not our own doing. It's a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. But what if you're not a Christian this morning? 
What if you, as yet, have not responded to the call of God upon your life? And I want to speak directly to you this morning, if you are. What's, what's preventing you? What's holding you back from making that commitment? Do you think you're such a good person that you'll get to heaven just as you are? No, salvation is by grace and not all the good works in all of creation are enough to do what God's gift of salvation will do. Heaven isn't a private members club that you can enter by way of your reputation, your wealth or your influence. Invita entrance is by invitation only as God calls men, women and children to himself. But far more likely is that there might be others here listening and you're thinking, why would he want me? Look at my life. Church is surely for good people, for nice people, for well-behaved people, for polite people, not people like me. Oh, I might be able to change for a week or so, but I'd soon be back to my old ways again. Do you know, I've been a Christian since 1965. That's a long time. And two of the most common reasons that people give for not becoming Christians are, number one, I'm not good enough. And number two, I know I couldn't keep it up. But such people are making two mistakes and maybe you make that mistake too. Perhaps you've sensed that God is calling you. You've been aware of the fact that something is calling you to him. And there in itself is the evidence that God wants you. The fact that he is bothered to call you. And if God is calling you, then he is most certainly able to keep you as well. Speaking to these people in Corinth who, who, who seem to be so far from God, he says, you're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Maybe, like so many before you, you're prevented from accepting Christ as your saviour because even as you're aware of God's calling, another voice is saying you'll never keep it up. Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Huh. But you really need to hear what comes next. Back at the beginning, I said that we have certain characteristics that mark us out and identify us as belonging to God. We've been talking about one. One of the characteristics is that we're all called by him. Here's a second. Every one of us who are Christians today, every single one of us, stands righteous before God, in spite of ourselves. And do you remember around 10 minutes in, I said, here, right here, is one of the great and most precious doctrines of the Christian church. And I promised I'd come back to you back to it well here it is it's got a posh name this doctrine it's called imputation if i wasn't a christian i probably never would have known what that meant let me read you a definition to impute to regard a quality let's say righteousness to regard righteousness as belonging to someone by virtue of a similar quality in another. I'll come back to that in just a second. And that's exactly what's happening here, right in front of us in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 to 9. Paul presents two incontrovertible facts to us in this book. Firstly, that 
many of the Christians in Corinth are living lives that are nowhere near sanctified, saintly, full of God's grace, enriched in speech and knowledge by God, obviously gifted by God. Secondly, God is in no way blinded to their faults, yet he sees them as all of these things and more. And how can those two things possibly be true? Yet it's true for me as well, and true for you too, if you're a Christian this morning, and it is glorious. The answer is imputation. Let me read you that definition again now. To impute, to regard righteousness as belonging to someone, let's say me, to regard righteousness as belonging to me by virtue of a similar quality in another. Who has that quality? Jesus Christ, my Lord. So God imputes righteousness as belonging to me by virtue of the utter and total righteousness in Jesus. To quote Jim, <laughs> boom. That is the most incredible thought, is it not? That when God looks at you, however far you might feel yourself from him, God sees you clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And God looks at these failing, divisive, squabbling Christians who are nevertheless still in Christ. And what does he see? He sees the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed to, to them. There's a wonderful old hymn written by John Wesley. And the first line has been changed over the years. We know it as Jesus, thy blood and righteousness. But one of the earlier version reads like this. Lord Thy imputed righteousness, my beauty is, my glorious dress. Midst flaming worlds in this arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. Oh, let the dead now hear thy voice. But, Lord, thy mourning ones rejoice. Their beauty this, their glorious dress. Jesus, the Lord our righteousness. What a glorious thought this is. If you're hesitating and delaying making that move to Christian commitment because you feel that perhaps you couldn't keep it up, be assured of this. Neither can I, neither can any of us in Hill City Church. But when we stand before God on that glorious day, we will stand dressed in the righteousness of Christ, imputed to us by faith. But this great letter holds out a further hope. And it's my final thought today. Let me take you back to our text. It's in verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So yes, the, the Christians in Corinth are in need of direction. Paul will indeed not paper over their failings and pretend that their situation is anything other than it is. But they're called to something far better. They're called to be saints. Some translation says called to be holy. They don't have to stay in the powerless state that they find themselves in, that they languish in as Paul writes to them. They're called to something better, better than they could have ever dreamed possible. And not only are they called to it, but the power and gifts of God are available to them as they turn aspiration into reality. You are not lacking in any gift, says Paul as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you, who will keep you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a promise this is, brothers and sisters. Corinthian Christians, every resource is available to you, provided by God himself. Every gift is provided for your sanctification. That which you need so desperately 
to live as Christians, to grow as Christians, to be holy as Christians. Those gifts that enable and empower, that sustain and sanctify are all provided in abundance so that you are not lacking in any of them. And to you and me, the offer is the same. None of us has what it takes to be holy, to be sanctified in our own strength. If we try to do it on our own, we'll fail and fail and fail again. And the enemy of our souls will take great pleasure in reminding us of our weakness and our fa frailties. And he'll try to make us accept our failure as normal. You're only human, he'll say, but we are not only human. On the day that we became Christians, Jesus came to live in us. We're not only human. We're not lacking any gift that makes for holiness. Sanctification is a gift from God. And if even these messed up Christians in Corinth are called to be holy, then so are we. By the grace of God, he makes holiness a reality, even when we consider it an impossible dream. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. We're called. We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We're the church of God in Pontoeneth, called to holiness. And if today you're not part of that church, Perhaps you should answer the call that you've been fighting for weeks and come to the only one who can sustain you in the faith and the only one who can present you guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. If God is calling you today into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, please respond. I promise you that God is faithful and will never let you down.